Toasters, phones, batteries that explode are all part of this year's science curriculum. Hello everybody, my name is Joaquin Ravello and part of the Canadian delegation and today we're going to be tackling the science section. I'll be talking about everything you have to know for the first part of the science curriculum. Let's do this. say in all my videos if you haven't done so already please share this video with your teammates with your delegation on your Google classroom on your web page on your Facebook on your Twitter wherever just spread the word as I do spend a lot of effort and I want as many people to see these type of videos as they are really helpful if you're the selfish type of guy you know you can just not share it I also want to say that I'm very grateful for all of the amazing support and all the amazing comments I've gotten in the last uh, few weeks uh, they really do keep me going and they really do keep me driving so always comment down below telling me what you think if you have any questions if you have any suggestions I'd love to hear it all in the comment section below also much of this video was researched and edited by my good friend and actually teammate of the World Scholars Cup Peter Zhang uh, he's into this type of science and everything and he's actually launching a rocket in a few months um, so you can check out his organization in the link below Anyways, this year is all about enabling technologies, meaning technologies that help you improve your life in one way or another. This year is focused primarily on the tech aspect of these technologies, as well as a lot of batteries. It's just the curriculum is full of batteries this year. Before I jump into this, I would strongly recommend you go over to the World Scholars Cup curriculum page and start filling out some of the more specific questions that I can't really answer for you, including uh, what technologies did you use this morning, as it'll give you a good perspective on what type of technologies you rely on, which will actually jump a bunch in the debate section. Don't worry, if you leave, I'll be here waiting for you. I'm going to first start off by comparing the terms enabling technologies and technologies of convenience. Um, enabling technologies are technologies that change the way we do specific things. A few examples include glasses, um, electrical motors, the internet. These type of technologies and inventions completely shape the way we uh, approach and do specific things. Technologies of convenience is defined by technologies that um, help us make our lives more convenient. Basically where all tech products are going right now which is to make our lives slightly faster, slightly more productive, just slightly easier overall. Batteries. Now how they work is that they store chemical energy which is used to oxidize the anode, which is the negative part of the battery which makes it become negatively charged. This process is called discharge, which is when chemical energy is turned into electrical energy. Once a circuit is connected to the negatively charged part of the battery, or the anode and to the positively charged part of the battery or the cathode, then electrons are allowed to flow all through the circuit and then come back to the battery. This flow of electrons is called an electrical current. You can think of the electrolyte as the chemical area that stores the um, electrons because basically what these batteries do is that, as I said before, they convert chemical energy to electrical energy. In short, the electrolyte stores these electrons in chemical energy and then converts it to electrical energy through a reaction with the cathode and then once a circuit is hooked up, the electrons can flow through the cathode all the way back to the anode. When charged, the ions in a battery are at a higher state, similar to like a wounded and ready to pop spring. When a current is allowed to flow, this transfer of electrons allows the ions in the battery to move to a lower energy state similar to unwinding a spring and watching it pop. Now how wireless charging works is that there are basically two induction coils in both the charger and the thing you want to charge, these circle, uh, circle wires. And basically what ends up happening is if you were to flow a current through them, um, it creates a magnetic field. The third being solid state, which basically referred to any electrolyte that is solid instead of liquid. Uh, liquid electrolytes include the lithium ion. In theory, solid batteries can withstand higher temperatures, which means they have a much higher capacity. Or in other words, they can hold more electrons and last longer. The main problem with these solid state batteries is that the battery tends to expand when charged. 
and this expansion can actually damage the battery over the long term. The final battery being a battery with bacteria on it. But very simply, scientists have gotten a bunch of office paper, added bacteria over it, and then started harnessing the energy using cellular respiration. They do this by using a bacteria species called exoelectrogens, where the bacteria can actually transfer electrons out of its body and into the paper, and the paper kind of acts like an anode and then, then the scientists can harness the electrons from the paper. The main reason why we would want to have a battery as thin as a piece of paper with bacteria on it is because of a growing field called the Internet of Things, where um, internet connected circuit boards are being added to literally every aspect of our everyday lives. And what's interesting about this technology is that it can pick up data and send us a bunch of useful information that we might not have known of before. The sheer quantity of devices connected to this cloud, the Internet of Things, it what is what makes it very um, effective as all the devices can communicate with each other, send data, and it can all be shared in the cloud. It also allows for unparalleled uh, control of all the devices by a simple touch of an iPad screen, for example. This is obviously very important for the creation of smart homes, which we will talk about in our next video. The Internet of Things also allows for the connection collection of data from places we would never have dared to check before. For example, smart fridges can can gather data for weeks and years and it can give you a good sense of what you're eating, what you like, what you don't like, and what you have to eat to become healthier. I, I personally made a product with the Internet of Things called the Get Productive Alpha. Uh, basically, it records the amount of time you spend doing productive and then sends that data over to, the, over to the cloud and then to your phone so you can check how much time you're actually spending doing productive work and help you set up intervals of productivity. Quite useful, right? Now, a few quick notes on direct and alternating current. Direct current, as you might imagine, flows in only one direction, meaning the electrons keep on flowing non-stop all through the circuit then back to the battery. While alternating current, the electrons still flow in that same direction, but instead of going in a straight line, they go forward then stop, forward then stop, forward then stop, basically going back and forth throughout the circuit until they reach the end. Alternating current is much more useful for long distance energy use, as, such as the power grids, which are these big electrical grids that distribute the power throughout the city with AC. Which is why if you've ever filmed in slow motion, let's say, at a trampoline park, uh, you will realize the lights turn off and on very quickly which shows the alternating current going back and forth throughout the circuit, and for a split second, the electron sits still as, it's, as they transition, which causes the light to turn off for a tiny amount. What actually causes the electrons to sit still for one second is in the power grid, or in the AC-specific battery, which is actually very rare. What you see in these types of grids and these very special batteries is that there's actually a spinning magnet. And since magnets are both positive and negative, on one side they're negative, on the other side they're positive, they tend to attract electrons when the positive side comes about, so the electrons go back, and then when the negative side comes back around, it repels the electrons forward. And then the positive side again brings them back negative side repels them forward. And converters change the voltage from 120 volts to 220 volts on average. That way your computer doesn't burn out if you're in some strange place like Uruguay. While an adapter is just a different socket you use when plugging it in. Man, I'm surprised I plowed through this section much faster than that uh, finding Bigfoot special area. I swear I had to film that one many times. I've seen something. Check, check this out. Um, if you haven't done so already, please subscribe, share, like this video down below, and I want to give a big thank you to my friend Peter. Check out his organization down below. He's making a rocket. He helped edit this video, and I really do appreciate that. So you can help him by checking out his organization below. I hope you have found this video helpful. Please share it down below. And if you're going to the Beijing round, please let me know, know down below. I'd love to connect with you. And until next time, Stay productive. I'll see you guys in the next Scholars Cup video. Goodbye.